All right. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our fifth and final event of the season for the Juris Digital Scholar Speaker Series. I'm Alana Lockwood, and I'm a third year student at Vermont Law School and also an associate editor for Juris. And I'm very excited to be here tonight. So thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, Juris is a legal news and commentary site run by law students and professionals around the globe. Jurist is also home to the Digital Scholars Program, which is the first of its kind designed to foster and promote rising scholarship at the crossroads of law, technology, and public policy. Digital scholars are up and coming experts in their fields who design original research projects for the public benefit. Jurist is piloting this program for the summer as part of an ongoing initiative to connect students for the greater good. So, Without further ado, um, we'll open tonight's discussion of big tech and antitrust with two very special panelists joining us here on Zoom tonight. Joshua, Dr. Joshua Wright, former FTC commissioner and current professor at George Mason University School of Law, and Dr. Fiona Scott Morton, professor of economics at Yale University School of Management, who previously served as deputy assistant attorney general for economics at the antitrust division of the US Department of Justice. Also joining us tonight, we'll have our moderators, Connor Halland, an incoming Harvard Law student and Juris Digital Scholar studying comparative data and governance regimes. And we also have Everest Fang, a Juris Digital Scholar studying antitrust issues in the US, and he's set to begin his studies at Harvard Law in 2022. So um, we'll begin the session with 30 minutes of moderated questions for the panelists, and we will conclude with a 20 minute audience Q&A period. During the Q&A, the audience can type their questions in the chat or raise their hands to get the host attention. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to our moderators. Thanks so much, Alana. Um, so as Alana said, uh, me and Connor will be moderating this discussion. I just wanna start off by thanking our panelists so much for joining us and for speaking to the digital scholars. I can speak for all of us when we say we're really, really excited to have you. I think this is gonna be um, a really great panel. So Connor is going to have the first question. Yeah, uh, thanks again, echoing everything that everyone said, but uh, we'll get into it. So, um, you know, both of you guys sort of epitomize to um, contrasting schools of thought when it comes to antitrust enforcement. So I think it would be good just to begin this conversation um, with that context in mind. So uh, Dr. Scott Morton, if you want to begin, if you could just elaborate on um, how you view antitrust law, um, its purposes, what its ideal outcomes um, ought to be, that'd be great. And then Dr. Wright, we'll have you, uh, of course, follow up uh, with your perspectives. Sure. Uh, thank you, everybody, for inviting me to participate in this. Um, I think Connor's question is a kind of a, a veiled uh, question about the uh, recent debate uh, over the consumer welfare standard. This, I think, for the students on the call is a little bit of a red herring, so don't, don't you know, hurt your brain too much over it. I would say that scholars for a long time have understood that the consumer welfare standard, which has been um, the goal in antitrust for a number of decades, uh, reflects price, quality, and innovation today and tomorrow. Okay, so it's broadly, what is the consumer getting out of the market? Lower prices, higher quality, higher innovation. And not just today, but innovation, of course, comes tomorrow. So those are the components of it. We've always known that. I think the recent debate has arisen because people on the left have pointed out that courts are not actually doing that. They're acting as if the standard was price declines only and we have to be able to see them right away and prove them right away and we're not going to wait anything else uh, very much. The far right in response says, no, of course we know the consumer welfare standard includes price quality innovation. That's always true. But I would say that end of the spectrum doesn't really think courts need to work too hard to to, to weigh it, unless, of course, the defendant is Qualcomm or Google, um, and then innovation matters a lot. But other than those kinds of examples, um, uh, there has been an emphasis by the courts on things that can be measured with, say, a differentiated product demand system estimation and quantified with, with some precision. So that's a little bit of a digression into that debate, but I would say that that debate 
the, the fundamentals of what the consumer welfare standard is, is not really under debate. It's more a question of what are we actually doing? Um, that would be my perspective on it. I'll wait and see what Josh has to say. Great, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Wright, if you would like to offer your perspectives, that'd be sure. awesome. Sure, and let me, let me uh, join Fiona in thanking um, all of you for having us. It's, it's fun to be on and always fun to be on with Fiona. We get to do this from time to time. Um, and, and I think I agree uh, with a substantial amount of that in terms of the contours of the debate. Uh, I think it is correct that there's not a lot of debate over what the consumer welfare standard is. I, I think I would separate out the world of the contemporary antitrust debate into sort of two battlefronts, if you will. And one is sort of within the consumer welfare standard. Um, we agree what it is. Uh, I, I think if I were to uh, spout out a definition of what the consumer welfare standard is under the law, uh, it would sound a lot like what Fiona described as the consumer welfare standard. And then we would fight some over whether courts are getting it right or wrong or what they could be doing differently. And, and I suspect we'll do, we'll do some of that here. Um, there's a second battlefront that I think is an important one. Uh, and I think for the, the, the students and sort of folks around competition policy who are uh, paying attention to the, these debates. There's a, 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 a loud and influential part of this debate that says, uh, hey, I see you guys over there fighting about the consumer welfare standard. All of you are wrong. We need to get rid of it. Um, and, and, you know, speaking for, for myself, I, I, I think that, that is a bad idea, maybe for a different set of reasons uh, uh, than, than Fiona might, so I won't, I won't speak for her. But I think that's an important part of the debate. I mean, there are real policy proposals around that would reject the consumer welfare standard in favor of uh, bright line market share rules, for example, a, a, a prominent proposal that has seen uh, both some press and some academic attention has been reverting to the 1968 horizontal merger guidelines. And um, since I, I will read them so you don't have to, essentially there is you know 10% market share bright line rules uh, that prohibit transactions. Um, and there have been other proposals around that. We don't have to do all of them now, but I think that's a second part of the debate that's sort of outside of the consumer welfare standard that has said uh, it has failed even on its, uh, it's failed on its own terms, but it's also sort of failed more broadly. We ought to have a more ambitious vision of antitrust uh, where it does things that have um, conventionally been left to other forms of legislation or regulation, go after um, income inequality or other sort of socioeconomic goals to sort of have a bolder vision uh, for antitrust. I think that's an important part of the debate, um, you know, and, and where I end up on, on those is sort of uh, more in line with the view that, um, and, and we'll find a place to debate this somewhere. I, I think there's no surprise that Fiona and I probably disagree on what's happening in the courts under the consumer welfare standard. And we, we can talk about that, that some too. Um, so I'll just I'll just follow up by saying I've it's been a long time since I read the 1968 horizontal merger guidelines, but my understanding as the non-lawyer is that those none of those guidelines block mergers; they create presumptions, and so you still are in a world of needing to go to court and uh, explain things. And then the second thing I would say um, uh, in response to that what no what was it? I had a good point, but now I can't remember. Um, uh, that the stuff that is not um, stuff that's not economics, like we want to um, we want to have more democracy or something like that, um, I think is very difficult to put into the same case as uh, as an antitrust case. So I I agree with Josh on that front. Income inequality, however, I I don't uh, uh, agree because you get income inequality for free when you do antitrust enforcement. When you do antitrust enforcement, you're taking a dollar of monopoly profit and making it into lower prices for everybody. And in the United States, who owns the stock, which is where that dollar of monopoly profit lands, it's the top 1%, really less than even the top 1%. So if you take away monopoly profit and turn it into lower profits for everybody, you are doing income uh, redistribution. You're getting rid of deadweight loss, improving allocative efficiency, and uh, lessening income inequality. So that one comes for free. Well, I will, I will add I will add sort of one point about the 1968 merger guidelines. The guidelines don't, yeah, I mean, I mean, 
they don't even create presumptions, uh, uh, sort of a, a point in your favor there, right? They, they recommend to courts that they do stuff uh, and courts either adopt or don't and, 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 it, and it's up to them. So sort of point, point taken, uh, but the proposals include the FTC adopting formal rules, uh, you know, that would create real uh, presumptions regardless of the effect on welfare of the transaction. There's proposed legislation in the Senate that would have uh, strictly dollar sized based uh, shares. And we might have beliefs of whether those are good for welfare or not. My only point is to describe um, sort of the, the, the menu of proposals that are out there. I think you'll sort of hear two general flavors. And one is within the consumer welfare standard, we figure out um, best we can the welfare effects of the restraint at issue. And then another set that says, um, let's adopt some shortcuts, either on the defense side or on the plaintiff side or, or what have you, whether they're size-based or something else. And also um, whether or not um, those line up with deleterious welfare effects. And, and I think that's the, uh, there's a lot on the menu in contemporary antitrust debates. And um, I think it's important to sort of lay out the whole, the whole field before we start. Great, yeah, thank you for that. I think that provides everyone some, uh, some great context as to where we're at today uh, with antitrust enforcement and where we might be going. Everest, um, if you wanted to take it away. Okay, um, so one of the most recent updates in this space was about three weeks ago. The CEOs of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google testified before the House Judiciary Antitrust Subcommittee. Um, so I think we all just want to hear your reactions to that testimony and um, see what you think or how you think that's going to impact the future of this space and this discussion. After you, Fiona. <laughs> okay. Um, I will uh, preface my remarks, as I do frequently, um, by saying that I have engaged in some antitrust consulting for Apple and Amazon. Uh, my reaction to the big tech hearings was that they were a little dull. Um, I thought I came away from them thinking that if this is where we are in 2020, um, antitrust is really slow. And I think if there are substantive complaints that are filed in this area after the Trump administration leaves office, because I don't see much sign of meritorious uh, uh, action there, um, then that's 2021 at the earliest. Uh, and then these cases often take six, seven, eight years. So, you know, I'm gonna have grandchildren before there's any change in, uh, in what we see in the marketplace. So I was a bit, you know, I went and had a beer. I'll turn, I'll turn it over to Josh. Well, we can start with the, I mean, I had whiskey during, so, so uh, to, to, to get through the thing. Um, so I, I guess my, my biggest reaction was a little bit of, um, I was puzzled a bit. There was not a lot of discussion of, of antitrust during the antitrust hearings. There was some great questioning. And I, I think um, uh, the, the Dems in particular, I thought there was some really sort of uh, deep dive factual questions into a bunch of business practices. So that, you know, there was fact finding and that's what these hearings do in part. Um, but in terms of discussion over um, changes in antitrust that Fiona and I might disagree on whether they're a good idea or whether we need them or what have you, but things like, what do we do about this presumption? What do we do to uh, speed up the pace of litigation? Uh, administrative litigation at the FTC, should we have it or not? Um, sort of a branch of litigation outside of the normal sort of federal court uh, uh, venue. Uh, there are dozens, dozens of, I think, really important debates uh, that are going on sort of within core real antitrust. And there wasn't a lot of that, doesn't surprise me. I testified in front of the Senate a couple dozen times. Um, and sometimes you get deep dives and uh, antitrust discussions and sometimes sometimes you don't, I think mostly you don't. Um, 
and so I guess I wasn't shocked by uh, shocked by that. The, the Republicans mostly wanted to talk about whether tech companies were mean to conservatives and um, a little bit more there. And whether their campaign emails were spam or belonged in your main. Yeah, they were asking CEOs of the companies to be their IT help. And, you know, my dad calls me to fix his printer too, and that's fine. But, um, but it's not an antitrust thing. Um, as, you know, it's, it's not. Um, that doesn't mean that those issues aren't, you know, important or worthy of congressional attention in some way or another. They're just, they're just not antitrust issues. And so I was left a little bit disappointed that um, there just, there wasn't a lot of talk about what I think the sort of important substantive and procedural debates around antitrust are. And that, those are um, maybe to the rest of the world uh, debates that are less sexy than asking tech CEOs questions about your, your, whether your email is working or what have you. Um, but I was left a little bit unsatisfied um, by the content. I think the real action, by the way, I think the real action is going to be those committees are going to put out reports, right? They're going to put out findings that are going to have probably, I don't, I don't know this, but they're going to have nothing to do with what happened during the hearing. The, 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 you know, the, the reports have, um, you know, a lot of people are working hard on them and have spent a lot of time gathering facts and they're going to write reports and, and maybe dissenting reports. And um, I suspect that those will be a little bit more substantive and play a role in the future debates that are going to be happening uh, around this area. There are lots of, lots of reports around and they'll sort of go into the mix. And I, I think um, Everest, where your question started is what, what, what comes out of that? Um, not now, but I think down the road, probably proposed legislation in the House comes out of that. Uh, what kind? We'll wait and see what, what's in those reports. And, um, you know, but, but I think that's what comes out is you're eventually going to have some, some proposed legislation. And I think where the action is here is, is that going to be proposed legislation that's mostly tinkering with the modern system? Or are we going to sort of uh, turn it upside down some? I think that's where what will be fun and interesting for uh, people interested in the space to watch. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Um, and Connor has the next question. Yeah, I mean, that, that leads to my question. Um, you know, Dr. Scott Morton alluded to this. The, the hearing was a lot more about anti-conservative bias than maybe anything antitrust related. Um, do you think anything will change if, uh, if there's a Biden administration in charge? Will priorities change? Will there be more rigorous enforcement of antitrust? Will it um, be targeted at different sectors of the economy? Um, just generally, how do you think a, a new administration will oh, change I, things? I think there'll be enormous changes. Um, first of all, there won't be corruption. Uh, we won't be uh, saying that TikTok should be sold to Oracle because Larry Ellison contributed to my campaign. and. Uh, there won't be uh, car companies under Nor Pennington making uh, emissions negotiations with the state of California uh, being open, you know, having an investigation opened against them or cannabis companies because the attorney general doesn't like cannabis. Okay, so all of these things are horrifying. Um, likewise, the intervention of the Department of Justice in the FTC, its sister agencies own actions uh, in Qualcomm and uh, just yesterday. Uh, Bill Barr said, uh, though the FTC voted to block a coal uh, joint venture, he was going to take a look at it. And I'll leave the lawyers on the call to tell me what jurisdiction uh, that would uh, require to do that. So getting rid of corruption will be uh, the first really good thing to come out of a, a Biden administration, I think. And secondly, I imagine that the Biden administration might uh, actually care about consumers, which would involve enforcing the antitrust laws. Um, and I don't see very much of that today. I mean, for example, the Qualcomm opinion, uh, 50 pages, which between you and me could have been written in five for the amount of content it had, but it said at least five or six times that consumer welfare doesn't matter uh, in antitrust. So if you've got a jurisprudence that says the welfare of the competitors don't matter, and then you've got jurisprudence that says the welfare of the consumers don't matter, what are you left with? You're left with the welfare of the defendant. 
Well, if we've got a law that protects the welfare of the defendant, we don't really need to do much antitrust enforcing, do we? I mean, we could just go home, say, could shut down the division and the defendants would be just fine. So, uh, so I think that's where we are um, in antitrust enforcement in the United States. And that is partly why, in my view, we have such high markups and we have so many problems uh, with competition in so many industries. So it would be wonderful to start uh, enforcing the antitrust laws. Although that's one piece of a competition agenda. If you are serious about a competition agenda, you also have to think about um, the role of various different regulators. So um, those regulators pass regulations and often it's the firms being regulated that lobby the regulator to get regulation that favors them. So when I was at the Department of Justice, if two airlines wanted to code share, so in other words, stop competing, they would write to the Department of Justice for an opinion on whether this code sharing agreement was pro-competitive or not. And we would politely write back, you know, it's not pro-competitive, it's gonna hurt consumers. And the Department of Transportation would throw the letter in the trash and say, oh, well, the airlines wanna do it, so it's approved. And that kind of regulation is unfortunately quite common at the Department of Agriculture and Financial Services in lots of parts of our economy. Um, I've uh, done a fair bit of research in healthcare and prescription drugs is particularly bad in this way. Um, and so if you wanted to lower markups and inject competition into more markets, not only do you have to have uh, an antitrust push, you have to have a regulatory push. So a, co a couple of things. First, um, I will you know, defer to Fiona on the grounds of comparative advantage on think, knowing about what the Biden administration would, would, would prioritize in term, terms of changes. Um, I, I share um, her disappointment in some of the actions of the antitrust division. I've been publicly on the record against um, in particular, the, the, the cannabis investigations, I thought were particularly egregious in terms of in terms of process, um, and, I, and I think there would be welcome change um, in terms of getting back to the the rule of law and antitrust investigations, and particularly in the merger front. Um, in terms of uh, the FTC DOJ stuff, I I, I should say I. Uh, do some consulting work for Qualcomm. So I, I you know, I, I might read the opinion a little bit, a little bit differently, and we could do the whole discussion. I, I, I don't think that's what the case says, uh, but either which way, um, that seems to be less a problem with the administration who brought it than with the judges who ruled upon it. Uh, and, the, and the Biden administration will surely get its chance to appoint judges uh, to the Ninth Circuit and elsewhere. Uh, to, to, to rule, and it was a panel that was bipartisan and, and unanimous. And if it's as wrong as Fiona says, well, well, and I'm sure the Ninth, the Ninth Circuit here rehearing on Bonk will, uh, will, will vindicate her views, but I'd bet against it. Um, I have less problem, and I say this as an, a former FTC commissioner, I have a little bit less of a problem with the DOJ involvement in the FTC's case. Um, it's, it's, it's tricky territory um, when one agency uh, gets involved in another agency's case. We have um, a weird system here where we have at least two federal agencies involved in most merger reviews. Sometimes with sectoral regulators, we have three or even four um, plus states. I mean, it can be a, a sort of a sort of messy world. In that particular case, you have a, um, a sort of weird setup, right? N none of the five commissioners who are sitting at the FTC now voted on or participated in that case in any way. Um, we haven't heard from those commissioners about whether they like the case, don't like the case, whatever. They were sort of stuck to two because one of them was recused. Um, and this administration wanted to say something about the case and they did it through the DOJ. That's not without costs. It's not without costs. Um, I do not think it is a good thing when the agencies fight, um, whether it's a clearance battle, uh, uh, you know, one thing that's been uh, batted around in antitrust policy circles for a long time is um, you know, a really common setup is agencies file for free burner notification and the agencies have 30 days uh, to decide whether or not they issue a second request. And on day 29, uh, they finally decide which one of them is going to take it. Um, and they say, you know, agree to our second request. We finally decided the FTC won the coin flip. Um, it is not a good way 
uh, to go about. It's not, not good government. Uh, it's not a good way to go about business. You have uh, agencies that can have substantively different views. You have that now on IP in particular, but you know, FTC has a, a, a statutory authority in Section 5, the DOJ doesn't have. So sometimes you have these conflicts. Uh, there have been previous attempts to try to iron some of that out. Um, I do wish that the antitrust debates of the day paid more attention uh, to some of those institutional debates and um, a little less attention to some other things. Uh, those are um, real problems. There is a you know, 6,000 merger filings every year. There are real costs imposed by having duplicative review. Uh, there are some benefits of having two agencies too. You know, you get some competition between the agencies. Um, but there's been long been talk uh, in the United States about what we can do sort of at an institutional level to streamline our antitrust institutions. Uh, other countries have decided they should go to three agencies or go to one. Um, there's not been a lot of that discussion here. Um, you know, I, and I think it probably would make sense uh, to have a little bit, a little bit more of it. My guess, for what it's worth, is um, that the Biden administration will look a lot in terms of enforcement priorities, like the Obama administration. I, you know, that that would be my my sort of working hypothesis, and and maybe I'll, I'll I'll be surprised. But if that's correct, I think that what you'll get is about the same level of merger enforcement activity. A um, couple more vertical challenges. I think one or two more was is what is in the record. Um, a, there's been a slight dip in criminal enforcement, uh, so I suspect that would pick up a little. Um, merger enforcement would be about the same, and the number of monopolization cases has ranged from zero to one to two. Um, has been sort of the range over the past, you know, handful of cases. Right, we're talking about. Um, you know, small numbers of cases. And I suspect that that would go up under the Biden administration, make no mistake about it. But I, I think um, my guess, and it's just a guess for sort of, you know, provoke some conversation. My guess is you would not see a revolution in activity. Um, but a revolution in activity is not the only benefit an, an administration can bring. I, I, I think what where Fiona started with some of the um, some of the violations of the rule of law and the process have been really, really disappointing. So there are benefits that can come whether you get changes in the cases or not. Um, I, w I wanted to follow up with another remark about the two agencies, because I know that uh, you guys are interested in that issue. Um, it is very costly to have two agencies in some ways. Um, for example, when I was in the Obama administration, the Google matters were split up so that the Department of Justice had Google mergers and the FTC had the Google monopolization case. Now think about that. That means the people investigating the mergers were not thinking about a pattern of mergers that might create a monopoly or maintain a monopoly or absorbing the disruptive competitors. The people studying the monopoly problem were not exposed to or analyzing the set of mergers that were occurring at that time. So you had, uh, by dividing the work that way, you actually had one people, you know, one set of people feeling the head of the elephant and the other set feeling the back of the elephant or whatever the expression is and uh, not able to put the thing together. So that's another kind of cost that comes from uh, two agencies. But I think when the two agencies work together as they, uh, you know, at least at my level, uh, when I was in the Obama administration, it was very cooperative indeed, and um, that worked well. So there's an upside and a downside. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you for your both of your answers on that. Uh, I think Everest and I have one more question that uh, Everest will ask here, and then we will move to audience questions. So if you all want to start um, typing those out into the uh, chat box. We will go through those once um, we get through this next question. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Everest again. Okay, yeah. So speaking of a potential new administration, um, I think that antitrust is a fairly complex legal and economic issue that not a lot of or a lot of voters don't consider a political priority, perhaps. So my question is, how would you articulate why the average voter should have this as a priority? 
what does your vision of antitrust and big tech mean to just the average tech user? Well, I mean, the average voter really shouldn't care about antitrust if they're about to die in a pandemic and there are protests in the streets and the you know president is trying to shut down the post office. I think, I think antitrust is probably, you know, not number one on anybody's list in in summer 2020 in the United States. But uh, absent all the crises, like a year ago, I would have said, well, a lot of academics were working on comparisons to the election. Um, and now because I mind like a sieve, I can't remember which one it is, but, but it was uh, Taft and Roosevelt and everybody uh, arguing about antitrust and antitrust was a major, major issue uh, in that election because you had the formation of these big trusts that were monopolies and the incredible income inequality and uh, monopoly prices. And the result of that election was a substantial um, ratcheting up of antitrust enforcement in a way that was beneficial to consumers. So why do, should consumers care? Well, again, it's not just antitrust, but it's antitrust plus regulation. Consumers have some income that they want to spend. And if every product they buy has a monopoly price surcharge on it, or has quality that's lower than it would be if that producer were competing fiercely in a market and had to try to get consumers to buy their product by offering better quality, that consumer's paycheck goes less far. They can buy fewer restaurant meals, they can buy fewer pairs of shoes, they can get less in terms of technology because the quality isn't as good as it would be in a competitive market. So it's very much a pocketbook issue. How much does your meat cost? How much does your cable TV cost? How much do these generic drugs cost? When generic drug makers go out and price fix, which they have been doing for the last 10 years, and a medicine that used to be $2 is now $4, okay, that's not a very large number of dollars, but 90% of prescriptions in America are generic. So those dollars add up, and presumably if you ask the consumer, she would rather keep the $2 and spend it on a coffee uh, than hand it over to be monopoly profits uh, to a colluding company. So it is very much about having the economy working for you. We have a market-based economy in this country, not a planned one. And the reason that we do that is because we think that markets are quite good at serving consumers' interests. They move to where the demand is, they provide low cost, they provide high quality to attract consumers. If your markets are broken, if they're filled with monopolists, you don't get that. You don't get anybody rushing for your business because you're stuck. You know, there's only one seller and you have to accept the price and quality that they offer. So a market-based economy only works when there's competition and that competition has to be enforced by the government because the firms themselves love monopoly profits. If they can become a monopolist and that's legal, they're gonna do it. It's very profitable. Uh, you can go back to your Econ 101 and draw the graph, quite straightforward. So I think if you imagine that you can have a successful market-based economy without antitrust enforcement, you are, uh, you're smoking something, um, you, despite Bill Barr. Um, so, so that would be my, my reason why, uh, and, and the bottom half of the income distribution hasn't had a real wage increase in 30 years. So these are not people with extra money to spend on monopoly surcharges in generic drugs and cable TV. So, so to serve the community, to serve the people, you have to have well-functioning markets. That would be a reason why you ought to care about it. Um, but I also think that right now we're confronted with such extraordinary social change and chaos that I can see why people are, are distracted with other topics. Yeah, and, and I... Uh... I certainly co-sign the proposition that there are there are bigger fish to fry at the at the moment, and and uh, no n no wonder why it's a sort of a little less important on the margin to that to the average voter. Um, it's true. I mean, one two years ago, one of the things that I had never seen in uh, local elections, I would get uh, people would send me ads of you know local elections and campaigns where people were campaigning on antitrust issues. Um, and I hadn't seen that in a long time. You'd occasionally get it in a presidential race. You'd get 
somebody, some presidential candidate would say the word antitrust and the antitrust bar would, would uh, get excited because it would get mentioned, you know, once, um, maybe about a big case or, you know, uh, some such. Uh, but it, it had really started, uh, really had started to, to pick up. I, a couple of years ago, there was a Senate uh, judiciary hearing about the consumer welfare standard. And I, I testified in the hearing and Senator Klobuchar began the hearing by saying her, her, her goal was to make antitrust cool again. And I thought, um, here I was, the antitrust sort of academic and it, it, it hasn't been cool this whole time. I'm shocked. Um, but I think it's sort of, it, it's, outside of maybe um, the attention paid in the digital tech space uh, subsided because the, you know, the world's on fire in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I, I certainly agree um, with where the importance lies when the, um, we get a little bit back to the nor normal world. Antitrust enforcement is important. Antitrust enforcement uh, and making markets work. Um, antitrust plays a role in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, price fixing is one, I, an, an important sort of average uh, voter competition initiative that both agencies have been involved in in different ways outside of, um, you know, punishing uh, price fixers is, you know, one of the areas, other areas where there's a lot of bipartisan energy is in the area of occupational licensing and state restraints of trade. You know, you have states that set up rules largely captured by an industry to prevent new entrants, right? So, um, you know, uh, and this is hairdressers and, you know, nail salons and- you Dog know, massage. Dog but massage. also doctors and dentists. Doctors and dentists and lawyers. Um, lawyers are among the guiltiest of parties. Um, a case that uh, I tried to get the FTC involved with unsuccessfully was a Fifth Circuit case in um, uh, Teladoc, which was, you know, the, the State Board of Medicine redefined the, the, the practice of medicine to prevent telemedicine in a state that was ranked out of 49th or 46th in some rural parts of, of the state and, and sort of access to healthcare. Uh, and so you've got important issues in, um, in private restraints of trade and price fixing. You've got important issues in state regulation. Um, and where antitrust draws these lines is, is, is important. Um, it is important to go out and identify and prosecute anti-competitive conduct. It's also important to set rules uh, that don't identify pro-competitive conduct and, uh, and condemn it, right? Um, and there are lots of interesting debates over whether those lines are in the right place uh, or, or not, but that's the complexity and also the, the challenge of getting antitrust right is, uh, that's easy to do in price fixing, it's always bad, right? Um, but for other types of conduct, uh, that's where I think a lot of the substantive debates are sort of where to draw, uh, where to draw those lines, what methods to use to identify the bad conduct and punish it uh, and separate it from the good because we want, we want, we want to encourage uh, things that are um, vigorous competition and that um, finding that line in substantive antitrust debates is where I hope the debate will turn when, when we get there. All right, so thank you so much for a lively discussion. Um, with that, we're now going to take questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat box. <laughs> yeah, it looks like uh, we'll start with this first question here, um, <clears throat> appropriate for a panel on big tech and antitrust. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts on the recent sparring between Apple and Epic? And I guess maybe for those of us who uh, aren't familiar with what's going on, if you could just briefly kind of describe uh, the, the tension there. I'll let Josh take that one. Sure. Um, all I know about these is from a combination of skimming the complaints and um, talking to my son who plays some Fortnite um, and, and having him ask me what this means for his life um, and shrugging my shoulders at him. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, these are disputes about um, the ability to set rules in your, in your app stores. And in both cases, there's a, there's a twin suit with Google um, who has their own app store. And these guys set rules for their, for their app store, rules about security and features of apps and different things. And occasionally get disputes like this, especially with popular apps. Um, 
where uh, the app store kicks you out for not abiding by those rules that happened here. You have lawsuits um, that were just, that were just filed um, two of them. I, one thing I will say, um, and this is going to be a little bit inside baseball for, for the antitrust people, but the one fascinating thing about, about the complaints, um, if you're interested in, go, in them, go, go, go read the complaints and, and there's some, there's an attempt, it looks like both complaints are framed around um, what we call Kodak claims and antitrust. So the Kodak's a 1992 Supreme Court decision, it's 5-4 with a Scalia dissent. Um, they're, they're aftermarket claims, right? So in, in Kodak, it is, um, you know, copiers and, and, and ink and service for those copiers are tied to the purchase of that. You buy a printer from me, you got to get the ink and the, and the service from me. And the court struggles. You read the opinion, they say, well, before the contract, there was lots of competition to buy the copier. I think the, the, the defendant had, you know, 20 something percent share. But after, you're locked into me, right? In the same way, you know, when you go rent your apartment, right? There's lots of competition ex ante, but ex post, I've got this lease and, you know, I can beat you up a little bit under the lease because if you don't accept my new terms, you, you know, maybe you got to move or, or, or something, right? So the, the leverage changes. In a long time struggle in antitrust is, um, is that second type of tension, that sort of contractual opportunism that happens after the contract where consumers can be harmed, is that different than antitrust? Is it the same from antitrust? And should we treat it as a regulation? Is it just contract breach? That kind of fight happens in a lot of places in antitrust, sometimes in patent disputes, uh, sometimes in real property disputes. Um, and Kodak is a Supreme Court case that a plaintiff wins uh, five to four over a Scalia dissent that says, um, under some conditions, there's a section two monopolization claim that lives here. What has happened since 1992 um, at least through five or six years ago, the lower courts have eviscerated these claims. Um, there, I think there's two examples in, I don't know, what's it been since 1992, 28 years. Um, there are two examples of plaintiffs prevailing on those claims and lower, lower courts have sort of fought back and said, it feels like a contract dispute. It's hard to find antitrust stuff here. I'm not comfortable defining a market as just a single product. Um, both of these claims, in the epic, uh, the, the epic claims run right into that head first, um, as if to challenge it intentionally, right, uh, and, and force uh, courts to, to sort of face this on on, on appeal and, and, and whatnot. Um, that I think, as someone who teaches antitrust for a living and teaches Kodak, is is is, is fascinating. Um, my prediction is, uh, so long as the claims continue to look like that, just empirical prediction. I, I looked this up the other day in a discussion, I think those Kodak aftermarket claims have lost 92% of the time or something like that. I was a lot of the time. So my prediction is they, they, sure. they lose in the lower court, but, but it tees up a really interesting interest potentially for review at the Supreme court. And certainly doesn't mean they can't include other, other claims as, as well. But I think for people interested in the development of, of doctrine, that's a, it's a fun issue. So let me just add one thing to that, which is Josh prefaced the Kodak analogy by uh, saying there was lots of competition in the primary market. When the iPhone was launched uh, in 2007, I can't remember, but there were lots of, or maybe it was earlier than that. Anyway, there, there used to be lots of smartphone makers and possibly due to insufficient antitrust enforcement, uh, we now have two. So it's not the case that you can make a direct analogy to a marketplace where there's intense competition up front and then there's this aftermarket piece. Uh, I, think the, I think we are in a different place with these cases where you've got two operating systems up front and then the aftermarket piece. Fair enough. Okay, so I think we'll move to the second question in the chat and we just also want to remind the audience that we'd love for you to take the exit survey which is also in the chat okay so the next question is for a long time we've avoided discussing protecting small business and favored protecting competition theoretically i guess as a frame for antitrust and how does this change post covid 19 where the bailout of big businesses while small businesses go under at historic numbers. Um, and I guess I would just add 
specific to big tech, I think that with the pandemic, we've also seen um, big tech in particular experience a sort of growth. I think yesterday, Apple became the first company to be valued at $2 trillion. So just speaking to the pandemic in this space, I guess. Um, I have a little bit of a boring answer to this one. I would say that you need to do your merger review just the same way as you normally would um, and be concerned about the acquisition of market power. You also need to watch for exclusionary conduct, which might become more profitable if the business you're trying to exclude is weaker. But in general, the action of the government to protect biz big business and crush small business or let them, let them die is something that voters need to address by electing a different government. I mean, it's not really, antitrust can't get rid of the virus. Antitrust can't make a business stay alive if the virus is driving away demand. So I'm not really sure why we would ask this question. Um, I, think it's, I think it's just a different topic. It's not an antitrust topic. I agree. All right, short and uh, sweet, easy one. Um, we'll go to uh, the most recent question here from, uh, from Christopher. Um, given Amex, how would you define the market for companies like Facebook, Google, and Amazon? Um, if you two disagree, uh, what does that suggest about government and the courts, um, given that you're both experts in your respective fields? Um, in other words, what's the best way for them to get to the best answer when even experts can disagree? Okay, so there's a couple of things going on in this question. So first of all, there is no way that in a 45 minute Q&A, uh, Josh and I, even if we talked a mile a minute, could define the market for Facebook and Google and Amazon in the absence of a lot of internal confidential documents and uh, econometric work. So, so I, I, I I'll see, you know, perhaps Josh will prove me wrong, but um, I'm going to guess that, that neither of us wants to do that. Um, there is a debate about whether economists should be allowed to be involved in antitrust because when you hire one, uh, each side hires somebody who agrees with them or changes their mind when they take on the job and uh, try to tear each other down and disagree. And that can be confusing for a court uh, because economics involves a certain amount of um, different thinking than regular people do, like the notion of equilibrium, um, different thinking like the notion of an opportunity cost. Those are often difficult for non-specialists non to grasp. I do think that we need, I, I am a big fan of using economics in antitrust cases, but I'm finding that it's really, um, courts are really not understanding it. They are really missing the whole point of a lot of the economic analysis that's happening. So I think we probably need to um, have courts have their own economic expert, perhaps the one for the plaintiffs and the one for defendants have to agree on the, the one that the court chooses, or perhaps we need a specialized court where uh, a district judge who's interested in doing it serves on a special antitrust court, kind of like we have a patent court for maybe five years, so they don't get captured, but they start to learn what a market share is and an HHI is, and we don't have to explain those things over and over again every time. Uh, and then they go back to the bench when they're finished with their term. And that would get us enforcement that was a little less, right now, that was a, that was a little less poor uh, and economically uninformed. Right now, for example, it's very profitable if you're and successful if you're the defendant to just create confusion because obviously the facts are not on your side. Now, some defendants have the facts on their side, but whoever doesn't have the facts on their side creates confusion. And if the judge is, or is, a, is susceptible to that, then the economic experts that he or she throws up their hands and say, I can't tell part these economic experts, I'm gonna throw all the economics out the window. And then you don't have a tool with which to make a decision. And that leaves courts in not a good place from the perspective of the consumer. Um, so I, I feel like we need a substantial reform um, to get economics to be working for the consumer. Uh, it's, not, it's not happening now, in my opinion. So I, I think this is a, a great question. And 
It really is, as Funkiana suggested, about who, you know, who, who does the deciding and, and, and how, right? We're going to have antitrust disputes and, um, you know, we're going to put them in front of Article Three judges or we're going to put them in front of specialized judges or we're going to put them inside agencies. And I think um, all of those things have been proposed in different, um, in different form and fashion uh, over the, you know, last couple of, of, of decades and different countries do this uh, in, in, in different ways. You know, I think a really interesting thing, I'm a little bit more of an optimist about the ability of generalist judges to handle antitrust cases, um, not without their own problems, but um, I've, I've written an article with, with Judge Ginsburg, who's on the DC circuit, favoring some kind of specialized court, not, not unlike what uh, Fiona suggested, where you've got district court judges sort of running through um, buckets of cases before they go, before they go back. Um, so I, I think all of those are options worth considering. I think the primary alternative to sending cases to Article Three courts is to give a bigger role to agencies in doing the deciding. Um, my own view, so you know, European agencies end up sort of being prosecutor, judge, and jury in a bunch of cases. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission, where I sat, has administrative adjudication available to it through Part Three litigation, and it gets to vote out a complaint and then sit as a judge, um, which is I don't know good work if you can get it, but is uh, not common in the American legal system that one votes out the complaint and then gets to sit as the as the, as the judge, um, and it should make you feel a little queasy to think that that happens, um, and and it certainly did with me. I was a, a, a vocal opponent of using our article, uh, our part three litigation, which is not a great way to be popular inside the agency. Um, but I think in terms of uh, antitrust decision making, these are sort of our choices, right? Do we invest more power inside regulatory agencies, um, less judicial review, uh, or do we go to article three courts and improve the process the best we can? Uh, Article three courts hear a lot of complicated disputes. Um, and I think where reform minded efforts, I, like Fiona, I am all in favor of uh, enabling the judges and giving them the best tools that they can to get the economics right. Um, it is surprising to me. I mean, we don't need any reform for the courts can appoint a special master anytime. Um, they don't do that that often. They do it in patent cases. And I don't know if this is sort of uh, judicial ego, like it's, you know, don't want to ask for directions. Um, you can do it in patent cases, but you can't ask for help in economics or something like that. But it is shocking to me that uh, it happens all of the time in patent cases where you have a special master, you have your independent expert on electrical engineering or chemistry or whatever. Uh, but nobody asks for helps in and help in economic cases. And so you get, um, you know, you get battles of the experts and I think the litigation tactics play out uh, much in the way Fiona describes. Um, and somebody's expert report gets copied and pasted in the opinion and it just sort of dep depends who. Um, and I think we could probably do better than that, but I'm, I am of the view having participated in the regulatory process deciding cases inside of an independent agency that that's, uh, the grass is not greener. Um, so my, my own view is uh, paying attention to how to improve the process in federal courts is probably the higher rate of return. Okay, so I think we'll do uh, one more question and then have Professor Hibbets close out the panel. Um, so Professor Wright, you mentioned before that um, you wish there was more discussion about this departmental FTC DOJ structure. And there's a question in the chat um, about given the complexities of digital markets, whether, what are your thoughts on the establishment of a digital regulator? Or more generally, I might just ask the two of you, you know, how would you change the FTC DOJ agency structure? Would you add an agency? Would you cut one? Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a, big fan of the idea of establishing a digital regulator. Um, antitrust, remember, is law enforcement. It's ex post. After the fact, somebody, you decide somebody's broken the law, you go after them, and six years later, you have some kind of decision. Um, we can't um, 
police the kind of exclusionary conduct that happens quickly with that system. More perhaps importantly, there appear to me to be many social needs that people want that are not antitrust needs that fall under the heading of privacy and disinformation and deception and dark patterns and data, you know, defaults for whose data goes where that uh, one would need a regulator to, uh, to supervise. I mean, you need Congress to pass a law, but create a regulator to supervise. And as long as you've got that regulator, I think it would be important to give that regulator a competition mandate because the way you enable privacy regulations, the way you design, for example, if I own my data or control my data on one platform, can I take it to a competing platform? Well, the easier it is for me to leave and take my data to a competing platform, the more competition there is in that space. So if I have some data rights, we'd like the regulator to enable those data rights in a way that's as pro-competitive as possible. So if you take that spectrum of concerns from privacy through to establishing a playing field that's pro-competitive, through to doing some of the antitrust enforcement that has to happen quickly or else it's not very effective, um, you get a set of tasks that I think are well suited for a digital regulator. I don't have a, a view on where to put it, uh, I'll leave that to other people, but I do think it would be tremendously helpful to consumers uh, to move in that direction. And that's not to say that we don't want to keep ant enforcing the antitrust laws, we do. Uh, use them, maybe um, reform them a bit, as I've suggested, uh, but I think that that's not enough by itself. So I'm, I'm I am skeptical of the of the idea of more regulators rather than 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 fewer. Um, you can increase their size, um, you know, and and scope and scale and and, and all of that. But uh, I am in general skeptical of the idea of single or narrow industry defined regulators, and and in part because of concerns about about capture, which we talked a little bit about uh, b before. Um, I do agree with the notion that there are some synergies in having a regulatory body that does both sort of competition and consumer protection type data privacy concerns. That that is something the Federal Trade Commission does right now. Um, it's got some jurisdictional limits, um, not much that uh, apply to the to, to the platforms. Um, but I do think there are benefits to having a regulatory body that sort of has those complementary functions. I do think the competition and consumer protection functions are. Are complementary. My my own view, not that the FTC has this right. I mean, my own view is um, the Bureau of Consumer Protection and the Bureau of Competition inside the FTC rarely talk to each other. Um, they're inside the same building and they're siloed off. And um, I spent a lot of time when I was at the FTC talking about reasons why that uh, why that harmed the performance of of the agency in achieving its mission. Right. They've, the whole reason to do it and have both in the same building is because they're complements and uh, industrial organization economics can inform both missions in ways that uh, you wouldn't happen if you sort of put them in separate buildings and, and the like. So um, I do think there's some benefit to having a regulator that see, see, sees the whole field. My, my, my own view is uh, my skepticism comes from having a you know, sort of tech-specific regulator that's not, I think there are benefits uh, in terms of the political structure of having an agency that's across a broad set of industries because you worry a little bit less about capture and the like. Um, so I would rather focus on the existing agencies, expand their mandate, give them more people, um, let them bring more cases more quickly. I mean, right now, um, I, I, I agree monopolization claims the, the, the speed's a problem. Um, one way to solve that problem is let, let, your, let regulators decide and, you know, cancel out judicial review and just make the regulator the king. That makes me very nervous, but you'd get speed out of it. Um, you know, uh, uh, so I think there are problems with that. As long as we're going to have judicial review and ju due process, we'll, these are going to be slow. Um, and I think focusing on ways to try to improve that. I mean, right now, at least speaking for the FTC, not the DOJ, I mean, right now, I don't, I don't think that the agency has the staffing to bring more than two or three major investigations at a time. Uh, certainly not to litigate them uh, against, you know, defendants who are well prepared and what, what you know, going to defend themselves vigorously in an Article Three court. Um, 
And so I think expanding, expanding the agencies, funding for the agencies, more economists in the agencies. Um, you have teams of 10 lawyers on every case and one staff economist. Um, I don't think that's gonna cut it for most of these questions. Um, so my own view is um, to, two plus the states, plus private plaintiffs, plus the sectorial regulators are quite enough. Um, but I'm open to ideas of um, modifying and adjusting the structure of the existing agencies. Um, heck, you could probably even get me to agree to one. I'll just point out that the ultimate form of capture, which of course the right wing is always very worried about, is not having any agency at all. We can keep and that's one. where we are. <laughs> so, so you can't go much further on the capture spectrum than we're at right now, uh, which makes me more optimistic than Josh. All right, unfortunately, we are nearing the end of our session. Professor Hibbets is turning over the close to me. Um, but before we go, I just wanted to say thank you to our wonderful panelists, moderators, and the audience, of course, for joining us today. I also want to say thank you real quickly to Connor Halland, Xiaoli Jin, Juris Digital Scholars Program Managing Editor, and also Megan McKee, Juris e Executive Director, um, for all their hard work organizing this event. Um, so thank you so much for being here, and have a great night.